Bill Baker, what was your vision when you set about creating the Borge Khalifa? Well, we were asked by the clients to create the world's tallest building. So we started with a design that was 10 meters taller than the existing building, so 518. But, but we, what we did is we took very basic engineering principles. A tall building is basically a giant beam coming out of the ground. And so uh, it was a residential building, so it had three wings on it, so you would have, wouldn't have any privacy issues as you look out the window. And so we generally made a giant beam that was with uh, three legs on it that, that went up to this uh, great height. Actually, during the, the design process, the building grew by 310 meters from where we started. Michel Villager, you've created some of the most beautiful bridges in the world. What was the concept when you first decided to create a magnificent masterpiece? First, from the beginning, you don't know it will be a masterpiece <laughs> or not. Because you, if I take the example of Mio, which is very famous, the first major point was to uh, select the place where the motorway had to cross the valley. And uh, after that, it, was, it takes much time, in fact. Uh, from the first work on the looking for the location of the bridge to the first concept, it takes three years. So it, it takes much time to locate the bridge and then to find a concept. But honestly, when it was decided to pass directly from the plateau to the plateau, the idea of a cable state bridge with multiple span came immediately because this was a single way to, to make something transparent, very slender and elegant. Ilya, you faced an enormous challenge in transforming the Panama Canal from a 19th century structure into one fit for purpose for the 21st century. How did you go about it? The first thing we did is how we're going to execute this project, that it would be a seamless execution, that we wouldn't have contractors one on top of the other one, and we had also a timeline. So the first thing we did is how do we split this big baby? into something that we can build reasonably. Was there room for beauty, creativity within it, that? It was more practicality. It does look beautiful when you see it from the air with the water saving basins. It looks like beautiful swimming pools when you look at it from the air, but it was more of practicality. How do we put these 14,000 container vessels through the Panama Canal? We were operating the existing canal and trying to build this mega project right next to it. Michelle, I wonder, how did you translate an aesthetic picture into creating something that was truly functional at the same time? It's more going the other way around. It's first, you see, first the bridge has to be functional. First it must be correspond to the functionality of the bridge and also to control the cost because these bridges are public works and they are f coming from the public money in a way of another. So we have also to make something which is at a reasonable cost. And then, of course, where is the, the elegance coming from? It comes also from the help from an architect because there is, there is always, in my bridges, there is always an architect involved. But it comes from the floor forces. This is the elegance must come from the structure, from the way the engineer organizes the flow of forces to pass the loads in the middle of the span down to the foundations. Bill, reflecting back on your early days, was there a moment when you thought, yes, I really want to become a tall building specialist? Not really. Uh, well, I kind of got lucky, okay? Uh, what uh, I, uh, in high school, I grew up in a small town. I, I took an aptitude test that said I should be an engineer. Okay, I did not know what an engineer was. <laughs> So I asked my mother, and she said, uh, both of my grandfathers who'd, who had passed away had been structural engineers. And so I guess it was just meant to be. Um, and so I, I, I went off to college, and I enjoyed the mathematics and the physics and the like. And so in engineering, you get to ap apply the, these, these mathematical and physical concepts to create something. you know. And for me, uh, I thought about different types of engineering, and I wanted to do something where I actually created something that that was an object, that's something that was, that was still there. You know, uh, there's, there's a lot of brilliant work done in process engineering, but I, w I wanted the product more than the process to be, to be my, uh, my legacy. And I think we're, we're all kind of searching a little bit for immortality. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so we hope that we build something that'll be uh, uh, beautiful and lasting. Michelle, was it the love of art, of great impressionist paintings, for example, that has really inspired you? Well, it's, cl it's clear that uh, you, you cannot 
create beauty if you are not interested in, in beauty, in, uh, in history of arts and, and everything. But it, it doesn't come straight like this. This is coming also from much experience, from, uh, in fact, in the first bridges I've built, the first one was just absolutely ugly. <laughs> uh, it must be very clear. And in the first years, I was not so much conscious and it, it was very much more to be functional and economical. But progressively, I understand that it was much more important to make something which is elegant and coming from different shapes. Uh, Jörg Schleich says that we must produce variety in shapes and it is possible to make extremely different bridges that on a very, very uh, logical, structural way adapted to the site, to the condition of the bridge and to the functionality. Ilya, I wonder with something like the expansion of the Panama Canal, whether you can really think about beauty, elegance. Are those concepts that entered your head during this entire nine-year period? Well, when, when I look at the project, I think it's absolutely beautiful. Um, it's concrete and steel. The, the gates are phenomenal. So to me, the beauty is in the creation of the project. When you went from a piece of paper to the actual construction and you see these enormous gates that transited from Italy to Panama in these vessels. So the whole project, the whole execution of the project is beautiful to me. Um, it's fantastic to see it grow from nothing into something. Like, like Bill was saying, it's, it's great to see something out of a paper to be there physically and you can touch it. So the beauty is more in the whole execution to me. Uh, it, it was uh, interesting, uh, uh, Michelle's comment. Uh, very early, early in my career, I was uh, working on a renovation of the Sears Tower in Chicago. And I designed uh, the structure for the stair, okay? And it worked, it was very functional, and it was really ugly, okay? <laughs> and, and, and this architect, uh, 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 who I worked with for many years afterwards, Okay, a young, uh, uh, his name was uh, Jen Kim. He came over and, and, he, and he, was, he was angry with me. He said, an engineer should always create a structure so the architect feels bad if he covers it up. <laughs> and so that, I think that's the kind of philosophy that I've, I've been trying to do is you know, try to create an elegant structure that uh, in all solutions, whether or not it's ex expressed or exposed like a bridge or if it's covered with a, the skin of a building, it, sh it still should be beautiful. How much did uh, the elegance of the building play in terms of the engineering? The single most important structural parameter in a tall building is the shape of the building, because that determines how the wind interfaces with it. Uh, right after we won the competition, we immediately went into the wind tunnel, and uh, the, the results were very bad. And so working with the architectural design team, together you know, developed a new shape, a new massing that which would behave very well in the wind. And we kept going back to the wind tunnel, and it was through that process that we were able to go from uh, basically 518 meters to, to 828 meters. Very different kinds of challenges for you, Michelle. Something like a suspension bridge, something that's very tall at the same time. So, well, I think the best is to take an example, which is the third Bosphorus bridge, which I designed with Jean-Francois Klein. And in fact, we had uh, eight weeks to start from a white sheet to the bid from the contractor. There were many problems to solve at the same time. We had to cross the Bosphorus with a span of 1,400 meters, which is very wide, slightly more. And everybody was expecting a suspension bridge. The Turkish government wanted to have uh, an elegant bridge. It was in the contract. And with shapes similar to the first two Bosphorus bridges. But we had to carry a motorway with four lanes in each direction and two railway tracks. And trains, very heavy. Uh, are not very well adapted to a streamlined, very slender, very shallow uh, box girder. Because when the train is at quarter span, the deck deflects, and the, the main suspension cable escapes the load. So the idea was to make something which was not done since the 19th century, to, to add stay cables. And so this is all the shape come from the way to limit deflections under the passage of trains by the design itself. And all the elegance of the bridge comes, in fact, from the structural concept. Ilya, that must be something you can identify with. Some of the challenges are quite unique. Yes. Um, biggest challenges when you build a project like this is the geological condition of the area. And if you look 
uh, the Atlantic locks and the Pacific locks, they look identical, but they were built very, very differently. And that's when engineering comes into a lot of details. Because on the Atlantic side, we have very soft soil. So the structure had to be built for soft soil. All of the excavation was done with mechanical equipment. In the Pacific, it's very hard rock. So we had to do drilling and blasting everywhere. And of course, then the foundation of the locks, you have to treat it because it's not smooth. So it's, it's the challenge of the engineer to design to the different soil conditions, which is very, very interesting. And at the end, they both look alike. And they need to look alike because we want to have some standardization for maintenance in the future. So you can have the same type of spare parts. So here's where the beauty of the engineering comes, that you create two identical items when the conditions were not the same. And the great beauty of engineering, you can solve all sorts of problems. But I wonder whether you ever felt that this was an extraordinary problem of natural resources, the way that nature has laid out the landscape. Did you feel very small? and it was a very, very difficult task to overcome such huge challenges. I tell people like you take a challenge e each one at a day, so it doesn't look like enormous. When you look back and you look at everything we had overcome, it's like, wow, it's, it's been quite a challenge and we have overcome so many obstacles. The biggest challenge was the grouting of the foundation of a 2.3 kilometer dam that we had to build to keep the waters from Gatun Lake separated from Miraflores Lake because there's a nine meter difference. And that project got a two year delay because like you were saying, you can see his structure, you cannot see yours, well we couldn't see the soil underneath. So it took us a lot more time, a lot more grounding to be able to seal the foundation. So that was a big challenge that we couldn't control. You just had to work with nature and overcome it. The other ones when it was designed, well, that's easier to overcome because you just modify the design accordingly. Bill Baker, you've spoken a lot about the role that tall buildings can play in urban development. I wonder with something like Burj Khalifa, when you look at it, it seems to be so integrally connected with a place like Dubai. Can you translate that to a context like London, for example? Well, you know, you know the Burj uh, Khalifa made a huge difference to the economy of, of the United Arab Emirates, to the city of Dubai, and to the development around there. But if you had two of them next to each other, it wouldn't do. You know, I, I think you know, Paris only needs one Eiffel Tower. Two or three would diminish it and you know, make it meaningless. And so uh, I think it's, it's a precious coin to be, uh, be spent carefully. These super tall buildings are like a marker, like planting a flag, say this, this, is, a, this is a place, this is a, you know, this is a statement. It's a, it's a statement for the entire city, you know, sometimes the entire country, so it needs to be done wisely. Michelle, I wonder whether the national context is important for you. A good design is international because it's something we, we, we look for something which is rather simple. If the forces, the floor forces is well shown, the public will feel it whatever, wherever you are. Ilya, do you agree with that perspective? Panama Canal, of course, integrally connected with the nation. When we decided to go with this project, Panama is a very small nation, so we needed to have a project that had proven technology, that engineering was not out there, that we, were, we did not want to experiment with something we've never done before. Saying that, though, because of the magnitude of the project, we did have some differences from the existing locks. So when you go out there, we use the same type of uh, uh, concrete structure, but the gates are completely different. We went from miter gates to rolling gates. Uh, because of the size of the gates, there was sound engineering with that type of gates. Also, the filling and emptying system, which is traditionally done through the bottom of the chamber because you have a smooth flow. Um, we only are building one lane. The existing Panama Canal has two lanes. So you can shut one down while you're operating the other one. So we went through a side filling and emptying system that there is in some locks, but we actually did tw twice physical models in France one done by the Panama Canal and one done by the, the contractor that won the contract. So yes, some of the things were the same as before, some of the things were very different, but all sound engineering practice uh, on basic structure concepts. Michelle, of course engineering is not just about engineers, you have to work with other 
teams of professionals, sometimes those with a stronger vision as your own? F first of all, we, when we speak of engineers, it's, it's uh, many different engineers. Oh, yeah. Just for a bridge, you have geotechnician, you have specialists of wind engineering, you have a specialist of earthquake. So oh, anyway, from the beginning, there is not the engineers. There are engineers, a team of engineers, and, 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 and many specialists coming on. I've always worked with architects, almost, at least since uh, 40 years. Uh, I've, uh, it's rare that I've worked with a prominent uh, architect like Lord Forster and once it's clear and, and it was also clear with, with Lord Forster. For Lord Forster when he start, uh, started the working said uh, yeah, on the contract it must be clear that I have no responsibility in the design because that if the bridge collapsed to give an example this is the engineer who is going to jail. That is <laughs> absolutely clear due to the personality of, of Forster because uh, his ideas are also to go to simplicity and to very direct shapes. And so basically the, the ideas were in the same line. And so we, the, during the time where we were developing the, 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 the concept, uh, we came every two, three weeks in London to, to meet him. And it was always the same thing. So we had first a meeting with his team uh, to prepare everything. Then after that we were taken a lunch in some uh, Scottish pub uh, close by <laughs> to uh, eat a haggish with whiskey. <laughs> and, and, and after that, we had a, 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 a meeting with, for, with Lord Foster. At the time, only Cernoman it was there. Uh, and, and it started always the same. So he f started asking to, to his architect uh, where we were, which was the debates with the engineer, why we did, didn't agree on something. Then he asked me why we didn't agree. And at the end of the meeting, we had a solution each time. And so it, it has been extremely efficient and uh, uh, personally I would be, I should be very happy if I could have an op another opportunity to work with him. Well, Beko, you of course have had to collaborate very closely with architects as well. Is that your experience? Well, a lot of times, uh, you know, you always have this discussion and you have different points of view and different bodies of knowledge. And, and a building is very, very complex. You know, you have, you know, the, the function of the space. You have to enclose it with, to keep the weather out. You have to have elevators and trans vertical transportation. All the mechanical systems and all these things have to exist within this one skin. And so, uh, you know, as we develop our idea, one of the things we like to do is for every building, uh, we try to keep it quite open. And we'll have many different ideas in play, maybe multiple schemes. And then eventually we'll get down to uh, one or two schemes, and eventually one scheme. And then uh, we'll develop that scheme further. And what I find very helpful, sometimes at a, at a point after it's, it's starting to get mature, is try to describe what you've done in words, OK? And if it takes, if it takes a lot of words to describe it, maybe you're not there yet. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe it's too complex. If you can get your description down to like, you know, less than a paragraph, that's good. If you can describe it that clearly and your concepts are that clear, you can explain it to the rest of your team. You can explain it to the other, the other disciplines so they know what you're trying to achieve. Uh, you can explain, explain it to the contractor and to the owner. And when you have conflicts, and when, when things, because you always have conflicts, then you'll have competing ideas or competing problems to solve, it helps you resolve the problem. Because it, you know, you, you've, it's clarified your thinking, and so you know that this, this has the hierarchy, this has the, the right of way. So you know, when we have to resolve this conflict, this concept is, is, is the dominant concept, and it, 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 it will carry through, and we'll have to figure out how the, the rest of it's dealt with. Ilya, I wonder whether conflict has been an important aspect of the past nine years. Oh, big time. <laughs> 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 big time in, in, in every sense. I think uh, people are more complicated than engineering. <laughs> engineering <laughs> is calculation, math is easier to resolve. But um, we had, for example, our, our main uh, arguments were against the designer and the builder, for example, the gates, uh, because the builder wants to do a, a easy factory type process, standard welds, and the designer sometimes can be a little bit creative to do the perfect design, but it's probably not very easy to fabricate. So we had a lot of uh, controversy between designers and builders. Um, in the, the, the concrete uh, pouring, the structure was so dense that it was really hard to place the concrete and to vibrate it, so they had to actually change the steel bars to a smaller grade and add more so it would be easier to place. Sometimes engineers can be creative and we want to do the perfect design, but when you want to build it out there, it's not as easy. So 
a lot of interaction between builders and designers, a lot of that. And then of course, managing a project of this size um, with people from different countries. You know, the consortia had people from Spain, from Italy, from Belgium, from Panama. The design was done in Chicago, in Milan, in Netherlands, Argentina. So a lot of coordination and a lot of getting all the engineers to look at the same solution at the end of the day. So a lot of uh, negotiating. So very, very interesting. But to me, the, the, it was easier to coordinate all of the engineers to come to a solution. But when the builders were going to build something that was designed, there was a little bit more arguments in there. <laughs> but you also had to coordinate with another group of professionals, archaeologists. Oh, that was fantastic. Um, and it was really funny because at the beginning when we said, um, if there's something found on site, we will core the area and within 48 hours we'll have an archaeologist on site. And at the beginning, people thought that's going to be so risky, you're going to have so much downtime. And it actually worked out beautifully because we had the archaeologists, we did some uh, research before awarding the contract to see more or less in what areas they could find something. So it, it actually worked out really, really good. You've become the first woman to be the top engineer on the Panama Canal project. Have you been very conscious of your gender? Yes. As a matter of fact, when I got appointed, I got myself a pink hard hat and a pink vest. So when I was out in the field, people could see she's a woman. Because it wasn't very common, it wasn't very expected. So without wanting to, it has become a symbol of women in engineering. It has been an inspiration in Panama for a lot of the women engineers. So I make sure I wear it every day when I go to work, to the site. <laughs> You've been working on the Panama Canal project for the past nine years. You've created something that is truly extraordinary, integral to global trade. What are you going to do next? <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. Um, whatever comes my way, I've always liked challenges. Right now, we're building a, a third bridge on the canal. Uh, we're getting ready to also put out on a bid on a port, container port, that we're going to build in Panama. So anything that has to do with engineering in the Panama Canal, I'll be there. <laughs> Michelle, you've built extraordinary bridges. You've built a bridge that spans two continents, one that's uh, arguably the most beautiful bridge in the world. What are you going to do next? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because you know, you, you, you win a, a, a design in a competition. So n just now I'm trying to enter some, some competitions, but uh, uh, you know, you, you try five times to get one and it's already a good result. Yeah. So I, I don't know yet. So I have some projects that are limited for the time being. Yeah. And I wonder what are your drivers once you've created something like the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world, mm -hmm. do you have to go on creating buildings that are taller, bigger, better, higher? No. <laughs> I, I, I'm, 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 I'm very happy with the, the Burj Khalifa. Uh, if someone asked me to design a taller one, I'd be very pleased to do so. But uh, I also enjoy working at all scales. At the small scale, you know, every detail matters. And, and so I, I actually enjoy working on both very, very large projects and very, very small projects. Because, you, you know, everything we have is, is a structure. This table is a structure. These chairs are structures. And, you know, you know an engineer could design this also. This working at all scales, I think, is very satisfying. But to, to add something, in fact, designing and erecting a small bridge is more difficult than a big one because you have less money. You have less money to mm. make to develop the design. So it's not so easy. In fact, designing and erecting small bridges can be more complicated. <laughs> three wonderful engineers, three extraordinary projects. Thank you so much for Thank joining. You very Thank, much. You, Thank you, Gajin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.